I met you. Um, so today we'll talk about conformal prediction. It'll be um, the first part of the talk, at least, will be an introduction to the area um, for those who haven't heard about it. Um, and then uh, I'll jump into like various applications, mostly geared towards like medical and biological imaging and so on and so forth. Um, so that's that's the plan. Uh, how long is the meeting? It, it's... Uh... 90 minutes max like you can yeah. just like use whatever so i'll probably go for like 45 minutes or something um or maybe 50 and then uh we can have plenty of time for discussion okay okay so conformal prediction what's the point of conformal prediction um conformal prediction is a, a relatively lightweight statistical strategy for taking arbitrary models like black box machine learning systems um, and then uh, sort of inducing them, not just to give you point predictions of their output, but also some interval of some sort, some uncertainty that tells you um, how good the model is, all right? So it's like placing an interval on the end of your model or that helps you understand its reliability. And the distinguishing feature of conformal prediction is that it works for any model. So, you know, we know how to do, we know how to give intervals on linear models. That's sort of a, you know, classical strategy. But what if we can't make any assumptions about the model at all? And we can't make any assumptions about, you know, the particular form of our data set at all. Well, that's what conformal is good for. It's good for pre-trained models. It's maybe not assumption free, but at least assumption light compared to other techniques. It's finite sample. So there's no asymptopia. There's no central limit theorems. You don't take n to infinity here and it's like 100, this will still work. Um, and it's really easy to run. That's why people are kind of excited about it, okay? So just um, before we get into it, I'm certainly, you know, not even close to the first person to work on conformal. And conformal prediction has existed for quite a while. Um, and only recently, probably because of machine learning uh, has become more popular, but it was originated by um, Vladimir Volk, Alex Gammerman, you know, the, this group and their collaborators. Um, and I'll also talk about a lot of work that's, uh, that we've done here at Berkeley. So there's, uh, now, nowadays, um, it wasn't so a few years ago, but, uh, there's a pretty big community of people at Berkeley working on conformal and I'll present various results from collaborations that I've had with these folks. And I think I might even be missing some people here. Um, but I, I've sort of flashed their names up on the screen. Um, a lot of it is actually um, based on some methodological work that I did with Stephen Lee, Hua, Adam, and Tal. So I'll, you know, go deep in de into detail on this conformal risk control type stuff. Okay. So what is conformal prediction? Uh, I'll present it via example. Um, let's say I'm a doctor. You give me an MRI of somebody's brain. And then I, uh, you also give me like a disease classifier that uh, tells me that the patient is normal, okay? So you pipe it through the disease classifier. It's just like some black box system. It might, you might not even have access to it. It might just be an API call. You'll say, hey, you know, what do you think it is? Oh, I think it's normal. Well, do you send the patient home after that? You just say, hey, AI thinks you're normal, therefore go home. You know, I don't need to tell you guys that that's obviously wrong, right? You don't do that. You have to have some sense of how reliable that diagnosis is. You also probably, you know, don't just take into account whatever the model says. You have to sort of incorporate that into some larger decision-making process, okay? So you never just take the top, you know, top output of the model. Um, instead, what, con what conformal does, at least in its simplest form, is it allows you to say, hey, I'm not just going to output one thing from the model. I'm going to output multiple things. I'm going to put a set of diagnoses that are, you can think about these as the plausible diagnoses of the patient. Um, and I'm going to give you a guarantee on this set. The guarantee is that on average, this set contains the ground truth diagnosis with probability 90% or 95% or 99% or whatever number you tell me. Um, and that will be guaranteed statistically. 
okay? Um, now there's extensions of conformal prediction. Uh, I'll also talk about these a bit uh, that take it past outputting these set valued things, at least these simple set valued things. You don't have to construct confidence intervals or prediction intervals as we call them uh, normally or you know, always. What you can do is let's say I have a segmentation problem like this. Confidence intervals don't really make sense on segmentation problems. You don't wanna give me a set of possible binary masks that contains a tumor. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass it through, again, a black box segmentation algorithm. And what we'll get is reliable segmentations at the end. So I'm giving a guarantee on the prediction, on the segmentation. The guarantee is that the fraction of tumor missed in the segmentation is no more than 10%, because that's a false negative rate guarantee. that says, I'm gonna segment this thing and most of it will be contained on average. Okay, so that's like, oh, if you miss a little bit of a tumor, maybe if you miss 1%, that's okay. But if you miss 10%, that's really bad. It's like, you're gonna regrow or something. I don't know. Okay, so that's the, the basic motivation. Um, the next thing that we're gonna do is we're going to uh, introduce some formalism here to talk about image classification as a motivating example. Before that, are there any questions on just like why we're doing this or you know what? the general idea is? So an example you mentioned before this, um, this set, which is like normal in scope, how useful would that set also be eventually, whether it's either no scope or scope that, I'm just thinking of like, what, what is, like how can you make that one? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll talk about how you integrate these sets into decision-making processes at the sort of at the end of the talk. Um, so there's a more satisfying answer than the one I'm about to give. Um, but, you know, one way you can imagine using the set is just to say it's more of a rule in, rule out sort of approach. You know, if with 99% probability, I can uh, rule out a bunch of other diagnoses that would have required me to do a bunch of other tests. You know, let's say I, I'm guaranteed that it's normal stroke or concussion. And, you know, th there's many possible labels here. And, I, you know, I'm guaranteed that it's not I mean, I don't know enough about medicine to be really honest, but you know, it's not some other crazy disease that would have had me do some special blood tests or something like that. Then you say, well, let's forget about that. Let's only pursue the things that are in the confidence set. That's, I'm, it's all stylized, but that's how you can imagine using a thing like this. Does that satisfy? Okay, nice. Well, let's proceed. Um, image classification. All of us are pretty familiar with image classification, but let's just set it up so that we get some notation. We're gonna have inputs. Those are gonna be our Xs. These are gonna be images. And we're gonna have Ys, and these are gonna be class labels in some discrete set one through K. So if this is image net, Xs are images of things, natural images, you know. And uh, the Ys are, let's say, you know, airplane, dog, cat, you know, deer, blah, 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 blah. All the thousand image net labels, that would mean K is equal to a thousand. Okay, that's our discrete label set. And we're given two things. We're given some calibration data. So the calibration data is image label pairs and we have N of them. You should think about this N as being something like maybe 500. That will usually work like conformal will usually work pretty well with 500 examples. Um, and you think about these as being IID from some probability distribution. Um, this is, you can actually weaken the condition. They can be exchangeable from that, from, you know, some distribution, some joint distribution. Um, but just for now, think about them as being IID. Uh, and the second thing that you're given is a model. We're going to denote it pi hat sub y of x, and it estimates the conditional probability of each label given the image. So you can think about this as being, I took my ResNet or whatever, and I slapped a softmax uh, layer at the end of it. And now I have like a softmax score for every class. Then pi hat y of x would be I input image x, and then I look at the softmax label of the y class. Okay, those are what I'm given. Now, my goal is to predict a set C of X. It's a subset of the label space. 
So it could be something like cat dog, right? But it's not going to be all 1,000. Predict the subset of the label space such that the probability might, on a new instance, on a new example, drawn IID, that my ground truth label lies in the set is greater than or equal to one minus alpha, okay? And this probability is over Y test, X test, and all of this data. So it's just on average over everything. So this is the central object of study in at least most work on conformal prediction. It's called coverage. Um, the reason, I don't know, I don't know the, exactly the reason why, calls it, why you call it that. It's, I guess an interval can cover a ground truth label if it contains the ground truth label. Um, this thing in here, when Y is in the set, uh, we call that covering. The set covers Y. Um, and alpha is the thing that you pick in advance. Okay, so alpha is like your desired error rate of the confidence set. Um, and you can set it however you want. Like if you have a model that's 40% accurate, you can set alpha to be 0 0.01, which is will give you a 90% prediction set. Uh, and that's perfectly fine. You have that liberty. Uh, the framework will still work. Um, it's just that the lower you set alpha, you know, the more stringent you want your error rate to be, the larger the sets are going to be. Okay, so that's the setup. Maybe any questions here? And how difficult would it be to guarantee covers given the training data? Because that's probably what people would. Oh, coverage giving the training data is um, is not hard. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's... Um, Easy. So there are variants like a conformal prediction that can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. So the long story short is that the distribution of this thing conditionally on this uh, is beta distributed with a known form. Mm -hmm. um, and it concentrates quite quickly. I mean, you know, at a root end rate, but, you know, the constants are good uh, around one minus alpha. Normally, if you have like, um, you know, 100 data points, the distribution of coverage is going to look something like this. And then if you have like 1,000 data points, it's going to look something like this. And then with 1,000 data points, you know, you might have like plus or minus 2% or something. Um, that's sort of roughly the order. In the in the gentle introduction to conformal prediction, which is, you know, a lot of this material is sort of repurposed from that, uh, we give like exact... If you want to like say have like 2% error, we'll give you what N you need in your calibration data to make that happen. Um, yeah, so you can get high probability guarantees. But really I never run that algorithm because um, this, this version is just so convenient. Mm. And I already believe because that distribution exists that it's not going to fluctuate that much. Mm. Um, yeah, okay. So prediction sets, what do they look like? Here's some examples of prediction sets behaving well. You know, what does it look like when these things do, do a good job uh, on some squirrels? So these are three squirrels from ImageNet. They're ordered from easy to hard. So this is easy squirrel. Easy squirrel, background makes sense. It's on a fence. We've all seen a lot of squirrels like this. And the model has two. So it, it gives you a prediction set of size one. It's like, hey, I'm sure that this is a squirrel. Very clearly squirrel. Now you get into a squirrel on the water barrel and then very weird squirrel on the right, head cut off, background is gravelly, weird flat tail. I'm not even sure that this is a squirrel. It looks you know, so like some other rodent. I don't know if squirrels are rodents even, honestly, but it looks strange morphologically. And the model agrees, it gives a big set, okay? That's what you want. Now, formally, obviously you want correct coverage. You want your sets all else equal to be smaller. Uh, that's a good thing. Um, but most of all, you want them to be adaptive to difficulty. Mm -hmm. Unnormalized softback score. Okay. Like uncalibrated. Well, I think it's calibrated, but using flat scaling. You know, it's, this doesn't have a guarantee of the number. But um, yeah, it'll give you a sense of how much mass the model thought it needed to take in order to produce these sets. Okay, yeah, so you want the sets to be adapted to difficulty as well. You want them to be bigger for hard inputs than smaller for easy ones. 
Um, there's various ways of formalizing this. If you heard of conditional coverage, that's a way of formalizing this concept. Okay, so we've been talking a lot in abstract about conform prediction, but what is the algorithm? Um, this page shows the algorithm. It is a very simple algorithm that we can explain in like three minutes. So we're gonna do it. Um, the idea of conformal prediction is what if we just use the calibration data to run a simple statistical procedure that learns how to produce these sets from the model, regardless of what the model is. So we're gonna measure the errors of the model and then figure out how to calibrate those errors in such a way that we can get valid sets at the end. So step one is like the measurement step. In step one, your job is to get the score of the correct class for each calibration data point. Okay, so what I mean by that is I took a neural net, I plugged in XI, my ith calibration image, and then I got these softmax scores on the bottom here. Okay, so this is softmax, and this is class. One, two, three, dot, dot, dot. Let's call this class YI, and then it goes all the way to class K. So if you just plot the softmax scores of your model on image I as a bar plot, you'll get this. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the score. So this one's the correct class here, right? If your model is good, this bar will be the tallest bar because the softmax score of the true class will be large. You're not guaranteed that to be the case because right, you don't know how good your model is. But generally, this bar will be large. What we're going to do is we're going to take the level of this bar, you know, the softmax score here, and we're going to call it E sub i. E sub i is the softmax score of the true class. Now, we have n of these calibration data points, so we just repeat this procedure for all endpoints collect the top softmax score. That's step one. That's the measurement phase. Okay. Step two. Step two is you take roughly the 10% quantile of these softmax scores. All right. So I've written it here in like NumPy. Um, but we'll just draw a picture because that should be easier to see. Let's say... Uh, softmax score, you know, one the sort of discrete distribution of the n softmax scores that we observe will be on the x-axis. And then we're going to make a histogram of them. The histogram will look like this. Whoa. My iPad has new functionality that when I scribble, it'll erase something. So that's not good. I don't like that feature. Um, see, what is this? So here's our histogram. And what we'll do um, is we'll take approximately the 10% quantile. That means I'm going to take a level such that Q hat, 10% of things fall below and 90% of things fall above, roughly. Now, if N goes to infinity, it doesn't, but think about it for a second. Asymptotically, what's happening here? If you give me a new image from the same distribution or a new image label pair, if I calculated the score, it would land here with 10% probability and here with 90% probability. Right? And that's because of the IID or exchange rate or something. Yeah, that's because everything's IID. We can obviously, you know, take any such distribution and estimate its quantile if we have infinite data. Um, but and is not infinite, so that's why I'm saying roughly 10%. In practice, you go slightly below here, but the factor is almost negligible. I'll show you what it is, but you know, it almost doesn't matter. Um, yeah, okay. So at least 90% of examples have score above Q hat. This is the calibration phase. And then we're basically done. We just start making predictions. So now we're at test time. Now we deploy. And at deployment time, what we do is we take our neural net. We plug in XM plus one. We get a bunch of softmax labels. So 
So one, two, blah, blah, blah. And then we threshold them at Q hat. Anything that's sufficiently probable goes into a set. So one, two, three, these guys go into a set. The set is the set two, four, six in this case, because those are the bars that exceeded. And this set has the guarantee. This set has the guarantee. So we're done. And this procedure, in other words, gives us the, a theorem. This is the theorem that first makes people excited about conformal. It tells you, yes, you get coverage. Um, and also your coverage is not too conservative. The upper bound requires another condition, not important for now. Um, it tells you that your coverage is at least one minus alpha. That's what you wanted. That's great. And it's also not overstating how bad your model is, basically. So it's usually, this means the set is not too big. And this guarantee holds for any algorithm, any data set, any level alpha and any n, any little n, okay? Um, any questions here on the sort of classification version of the procedure before we keep going? Is there like a general version of the theorem where the uncertainty representation is not the set? Like, like for different output types, you would. Yeah. Need, so, yeah. um, in our so, yeah, in conformal risk control, um, I think we still talk about sets, but the, oftentimes the things that we output are not sets. Um, and then we have this new conformal decision theory paper where we show how to do this for general decision functions that are not like where sets might not even make sense mm -hmm. and things aren't nested even in the same way that sets are. Um, so there's there's variants of this that work outside of sets, yeah. So it's like any software with the output base, uh, like you can write the same statement for like when the output of conformal prediction is any software with the output space. Like for um, the segmentation, for instance, like what would the set be like? Yeah, so the the variant of conformal that works for non-set valued things, another way of interpreting conformal is like this. I'm going to draw um, a CDF of the score function. The score function conformal, the conformal score, as we often call it, is one minus the softmax score from above. Uh, it's supposed to be, you know, the convention that at least we normally use, myself and collaborators, is that um, large score means large uncertainty. Okay, so it's one minus the softmax score. What you do is you construct a, the CDF of these scores, and you take like the n plus one, one minus alpha over n quantile of them. So what you can think about this as doing is controlling a loss function that's zero, one value, and then picking some parameter that controls that loss such that um, your loss is low. In other words, if, if your loss is zero, one valued, you have some parameter loss on Calib set. Your loss may look like this the loss of your predictions. So this might be like whether your prediction contains the tumor. Then you threshold the loss and you say, where, when is my loss guaranteed to be smaller than one minus, alpha minus one minus alpha over n on the, when is it, what's like the smallest lambda such that it's guaranteed to be lower than this on the calibration data set. And that lambda will be like the conformal lambda that you use to make your predictions. I'll explain that in more detail soon, but that version of things you could, makes it easier to think about um, conformal outside the prediction set yeah. territory. Um, yeah, okay. That was probably a little bit like uh, detailed for people that are exposed to this for the first time. 
but <laughs> so don't worry if that part wasn't didn't make any sense. Um, maybe it's worth saying that conformal prediction, you know, I just present the conformal prediction as an algorithm for classification with a very particular choice of score, you know, this top soft max score thing. But um, in reality, conformal prediction works basically for any machine learning problem. Uh, and the way that I just presented its use in classification is not the only way to use it classification. So the general algorithm of conformal prediction is the first thing you do is identify some heuristic notion of uncertainty. Just, you know, it can be like the variance of your ensemble. It can be like I trained a quantile regression. It can be, I don't know, I estimated a Bayesian posterior and looked at the interval width. Um, it can be any of those things. Um, and then you use that to define some score function. The score function is some number that's large when your model is like, um, when your model's uncertain, let's say, uh, and small when your model is certain. Um, and then you compute Q hat. Um, Q hat is the n plus one over n times one minus alpha quantile of these scores. So this is that correction from before. Remember we took the 10% quantile before? Now there's some sign flipping, which I just talked about. Um, so you're taking the one minus 10%, the 90% quantile of the softmax scores, but one minus, you know, everything has a one minus in front of it. Um, and the correction factor that you apply is this n plus one over n. So as when n is 100, you're really not inflating this very much. The point being um, that conformal is almost doing the totally naive thing that you would do naturally, which is just like look on my calibration data and see when my sets cover with the right fraction of the time. Um, and you're adding this like basically infinitesimal correction um, that gives you the guarantee, but doesn't cost much in terms of your um, actual performance like size. So, so just doing the fact for example before, and just to check understanding, basically zero is the softmax score. So our answer to a heuristic that we would use in classification is softmax score. Yep. The score function would then be this one minus the softmax score. And then yep. we would do like that correction with our 10% or 90%. You know, yep. And, and, and afterwards you create a set. Yeah. And then you create a set with it. Exactly. And the set that you create is like the set of labels that have low uncertainty. Right. Or whose softmax score is high. Um, so yeah, in that sense, you can think about conformal as a way of taking heuristic notions of uncertainty and then making them rigorous. Now, if your heuristic uncertainty is very bad, conformal will not fix that. Conformal will give you like massive sets, basically, usually. Like if you can choose conformal literally for like any like real valued input, you know? So as long as things are exchangeable. So one thing that you can do is you can just input like one for every data point as your heuristic notion of uncertainty. Okay, well, if you do that, then the sets are gonna have fixed width. You're just gonna find me the smallest set that, you know, contains 90% of the true data points where every example has the same set size basically that's no good usually you don't do that um another way of doing this would be uh, i input like random noise for the heuristic notion of uncertainty okay that's obviously awful what will happen is that your sets will be like you know massive 90 percent of the time um in the sense that they'll like contain the entire set of possible labels um but usually what you do is you have a model that like gets you pretty close to the right answer anyway and you just want to run like a lightweight calibration procedure to make sure that you get the guarantee at the end. And that's what conformal is really good for. Okay. So yeah, that's like um, the end of the intro to conformal. Uh, and now I'll go into extensions of conformal and applications. So maybe if somebody has like conceptual questions here, it'd be a good time to ask them. So what happens if the, like the true noise is not symmetric. Does this automatically take care of what the, the true noise like meaning the, like the conditional variance? The conditional the variance is heteroscedastic or something, um, and it's not symmetric. Yeah. 
So um, like you still have the guarantee, but is this the best intergroup that you could just come up with with the same guarantee? No, that conformal doesn't guarantee you that the intervals are efficient. good. Yeah, efficient in any way. No, it doesn't guarantee you that. Um, now, what you can do is like run a quantile regression, which is asymptotically efficient. Um, and then like a non you know, obviously non-parametric quantile regression, you know, the appropriate quantile regression will have that efficiency guarantee. And then you pipe it through conformal, it won't change it that much. Um, so through that, you can get efficient intervals. Basically the point is if you use a good model, the properties of the model will translate it to the intervals. Okay. So now let's talk about some of the ideas that we've already brought up. Um, a lot of times in practice, uh, coverage it doesn't even make sense to talk about, or you may not care about coverage. Um, but it turns out that conformal prediction can be used for things that are not coverage as well. So in particular, this is conformal prediction. It says the probability the label's not in the set is less than or equal to alpha. This is just writing like one minus coverage is greater than or equal to one minus one minus alpha, right? It's just a rephrasing of the coverage guarantee from before. This is what conformal gives you. And you can rewrite this using the definition of the probability symbol as this. And when you look at this, this is the expected value of something is less than or equal to alpha. And this thing here, you can think about it as a, a loss. It's the zero one loss. It says, if I don't cover, I'm gonna give you a plus one. And if I cover, I'm gonna give you a zero. So the fraction of times you cover, should be greater than or equal to minus alpha, i.e. the fraction of times you miss cover should be less than or equal to alpha. All right? So the point is that conformal prediction works, basically, there's variants of conformal prediction that will work no matter what loss that you plug in here. You can plug in any loss. Now, usually conformal prediction is best when this loss is monotone. And when the loss is monotone in some parameter, this was like the lambda that we drew before. Um, then it's very easy to get risk control. So this is the conformal risk control paper that we've been talking about. What it will tell you is that the expected value of any monotone loss of some function of X and Y will be less than or equal to alpha if you run a particular calibration procedure, which I'll explain. So an example of this would be like my segmentations contain 90% of the ground truth tumor. Um, but it goes far beyond that. Um, yeah, it also handles the cases where different mistakes cost different amounts. So if you're worried that, oh yeah, like missing a stroke is more severe than missing a concussion, you factor that in using the same exact machinery. So for our running example, we're gonna to return to these uh, these polyp, polyp segmentation uh, examples. So here, you know, these are the polyps. Um, the, this is like the output of the procedure that we'll talk about. The white is true positives, black is true negatives, blue is false positives, red is false negatives. We're trying to bound the red. So the blue is over segmentation, red is under segmentation, basically. You don't wanna to have too much under segmentation. Better to be more aggressive uh, in the way that you provide treatment, so to speak. In this obviously uh, farcical example. Um, Okay, so what's our setup? The X's are the images. The Y's are the true binary masks. You know, the white plus blue. Um, and uh, we also have a model. And the model, we're just gonna call it P hat. It's gonna estimate the probability at each pixel that that pixel comes from one of these polyps. It's a segmentation model, but before you binarize. So what I've drawn here, is just the segmentation model before binarizing on like a slice of tissue. Okay, so I've taken a one-dimensional slice, I've plotted just the raw outputs of the segmentation network. And the point here is that 
the one dimensional parameter that you tune to control your risk is the binarization threshold. You say, how certain does my model need to be that a pixel comes from a tumor before I call it a tumor? And we're gonna index lambda in a slightly weird way, just for convenience of the math. Small lambda is gonna mean um, like small segmentation, which means large risk. Smaller lambda means I have a greater risk of um, possibly uh, missing tumor pixels, right? Because we're on, there's more risk of under segmentation. And of course, large lambda, large set, low risk. And the goal is to find the happy medium, right? So we don't want either of the extremes. We want to be able to tune lambda up and down such that we find, you know, just this spot or something, the baby bear situation. Okay. So I've written the false negative right here. It's not that important to like parse this mathematically, but this is the fraction of tumor pixels that I miss on average. Yeah, I'll show you how we choose lambda. I'll show you an explicit algorithm for how to choose lambda in like a couple slides. Uh, but conceptually, the idea is I look at the risk on my calibration data and I find like the smallest lambda. Small lambda, small set. Yeah. The smallest lambda such that the risk is controlled. So you can think about it as that as being analogously like the smallest prediction set that covers the smallest segmentation that contains most of my tumor. And you can do that in a way that will give you this risk control guarantee. So here's the algorithm. The algorithm is First, you calculate the empirical risk. So parsing this from the inside out, this C lambda XI is the prediction or prediction set, whatever it may be, the thing that's sort of nested in lambda. Whoa. This is your true label, your true binary mask, let's say. And you're taking the loss with respect to these guys for a particular choice of lambda. And then you average the losses on your calibration data points. You're taking the average loss on your calibration data. Now you do that for every lambda, you have a risk curve. You don't actually have to compute for every lambda, but just conceptually, we have this as a function of lambda. Obviously we can keep computing for any fixed lambda. And then lambda hat, we set it to be the smallest lambda such that the empirical risk is less than or equal to alpha. Okay, that would be the naive way of going about it. And then we subtract this tiny correction term one minus alpha over n. Okay, so we threshold our risk at a slightly conservative level, and that will give us the risk control guarantee, which is basically exactly the same as the covered guarantee. By the way, if you set the loss to be zero one value, um, if you set the loss to be zero one value, then uh, this exactly reduces to conformal prediction, the procedure from before. Um, but it generalize it basically strictly generalizes it. This guarantee also essentially reduces to the same guarantee. Okay. And again, we'll work for any algorithm data set alpha and n. And the tumor... Can I ask a quick question. Yeah, please, please. Um, when you so for the general case here, you said the loss has to be monotone. I just want to clarify that I understand what that meant. I'm gathering like small lambda should mean small set. However, you've set up this set C. Um, and when you say monotone, you mean as the set, get, set gets bigger, the loss should be monotonically decreasing. Exactly. Yeah, that's okay, how you got it. Set. Yeah, there may not be a set involved. Um, right, fair yes. enough. Yeah. That's it. But whatever C, whatever C of X is, um, basically as lambda is going up, this should be going down. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Exactly. So I'm just drawing a picture of it here. You have some risk. It's monotone decreasing in lambda because of the way you set up the problem. Um, and then you pick lambda hat to be this level, you know. Makes sense. Yeah. 
three. Yeah, so in the tumor example, um, this is pretty easy. You take your sigmoid scores as the output of the model. You calculate your empirical false negative rate. Um, and then you take lambda to be that value, same value as before. And you deploy by taking my segmentations to be all places where, before I call this p hat x, I guess, um, all places where my probability of being a tumor is large. Okay. This will give you the guarantee. So now talking about some applications, um, I'll just sort of like go through a bunch of stuff in sequence because it's fun to look at, fun to look at some cool results. But yeah, so this paper is um, called Image to Image Regression with Distribution Free Uncertain Quantification Applications in Imaging. <laughs> Long title. Um, but the idea here is like, let's say um, we're doing something like MRI super resolution. We're undersampling case space. Um, and then we want to uh, reconstruct, right? We want to reconstruct using deep learning. People are trying to do this nowadays, but obviously the issue is hallucinations. So if you look here, this is the reconstruction from like a unit. Um, and then if you look on the right-hand side, well, you know, there's a, there's a hallucination here. Here there's a little like tear and here there's no tear. So the model has hallucinated this little black line. Um, and what you want is some uncertainty that tells you, hey, you know, that's, that's a hallucination, trying to identify those. Um, so what you can do is you can run quantile regression, basically pixel-wise on this whole image, like an image-valued quantile regression. Um, and then you calibrate that using conformal, using the same toolkit as above, such that 90% of the pixels contain the ground truth um, pixel value. 90% of the intervals on every pixel. And then what you'll get is uncertainty that's sort of guaranteed to you know, contain the entire ground truth image. And then when those are big, you know that there might be a hallucination there. Here I've just like plotted the interval width as a heat map. Um, and you can see that the hallucination is big. Okay. Um, another cool thing about this sort of general framework, by the way, I, I, I tend to be kind of a proponent of quantile regression. Um, Quantile regression avoids all the like resampling and, oh, do I use dropout, blah, blah, blah. You know, I need to take like 50 different like ensembles, this and that. It avoids all that stuff. It's a really good technique. I've found it to be very effective in experiments. Um, you know, it's an old technique um, since I think 1978, it's existed at least. Roger Conker, Gilbert Bassett. Um, if you haven't experimented with quantile regression and you're working with uncertainty, I want to put a plug in there for you. Okay, um, here's another example of how conformal can be used, you know, very much uh, not set valued. Um, so here we're doing hierarchical classification. The idea is, hey, uh, you know, my model might be certain that something's a dog, but not be sure what breed of dog. Why would I force it to output a label that it's more granular than what that model is actually certain about? So this is ImageNet. I just like took ImageNet, um, you know, every like label in ImageNet has a hierarchy. There's like a hierarchy of objects called WordNet. Um, and every label has a softmax score. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go up the tree of labels up until we're close to an ancestor of the true ground truth label. Um, and our distance in this graph is gonna be the loss function that we calibrate. So obviously the larger, the, the farther we go up the tree, that's like our Lambda. The farther we go up the tree, the lower our loss is gonna be because we're gonna eventually hit like object and everything's an object. Right? And if you go further, further down, you're guaranteed that the loss is going to increase and increase. Um, unless, of course, your model was right. Like the model, the one node that your model got was right. Um, so that's basically the setup. Um, and it gives you predictions that look like this. So this is a consom. It's uh, like some sort of a stew, I guess. Um, and uh, the model thought it was hot pot. So the model thought, you know, the model thought wrong. It's clearly not a hot pot. Um, but using this hierarchical procedure, the model says, hey, you know, I'm not sure if it's a pizza, meatloaf, burrito, pot. You know, it's not sure about any of these. So it will go up until it says dish. Um, in other words, the sum of all of these is certain enough that say, hey, you know, I'm sure that it's a dish. Um, and that's correct. Another example is down here. So the ground truth example, the ground truth label spotlight. Model thought it was a candle. Actually, both of these are wrong. This is a mislabeling in ImageNet. It's neither a spotlight nor a candle. It is a lava lamp. 
Um, and that's what the, the model goes up. You know, it's not sure. It, so it goes up all the way until it gets lamp. I guess lava lamp is a lamp. So um, that's another example of how you can use the technique. Um, I'll just flash this on the screen because it's kind of cool. Um, you don't have to control one risk. You can control many risks all at the same time. And we have machinery for doing that in a paper that's called Learn Then Test. Um, this is a paper with uh, Stephen, Li Hua, Emmanuel Candez, and, and Mike. Um, and here, like the task is to do object detection. So it's identify all the people in the image, segment them, and also give me prediction sets on the class. So you're doing these three tasks all at once. Um, and you can do this task in such a way that you guarantee something about each stage of the procedure. You say, I'm going to guarantee that there's going to be high recall of all the different objects in the image. I'm going to guarantee you that the segmentations are good in terms of false negative rate. And I'm going to guarantee you coverage on the prediction sets. All of that is going to be joined. Um, and we have techniques for doing that as well. Um, not worth going into all the details about that. Um, if you're interested, you could read the paper. But just to know that these very complex tasks can also be handled. Here's a fun example. Um, latent space uncertainty. So a lot of times, you know, anybody that's worked in imaging knows that like pixel-wise uncertainty, you usually don't care about that. You don't care about having uncertainty on whether this, you know, that's not, that's just not the granularity at which we view things. Things are, we want uncertainty on features. We want uncertainty on whether a particular type of thing is in an image. Um, so what you can do is you can take like, if you have a disentangled GAN or something, you can create intervals within the GAN's latent space and then propagate those into uncertainty intervals that look like images. So here's what that looks like. Um, this is for an inpainting task and the latent space is discovered by style GAN. So here is an input. Um, it uh, doesn't, it's not masked at all. Um, and here's like the lower and upper quantiles that you get from this procedure, i.e. like constructing intervals in the latent space plugging them back in through the GAN to visualize them. So you can see that these are the same. Like there's no uncertainty here. This is what the lady looks like and the model is sure about that. But what happens when you mask out the eyes? So now the model can't be sure about what's down here, right? This is ground truth. This is the model's prediction. So, you know, it's close, but no cigar. And then here's the intervals. Glasses, no glasses. Cool. The model's not sure that there are glasses. Interesting semantic information. What happens when you block out the mouth? Smile, less of a smile. Hey, we don't know to what degree she's smiling. Cool. Now, how about this? Let's block out everything. Whoa, 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 scary. Yeah, you get trash out. So that makes sense. You should get trash when you don't know anything. Um, now, Another uh, example that I found useful in collaborations with doctors, um, I have an ongoing collaboration with uh, some folks at Mass Gen Brigham, um, is the doctors will be doing something like, I don't know, like they'll take CTs and they'll ask you whether or not there's a stroke happening. They'll use that for the purposes of triage. Low risk people for stroke might go into a different queue. High risk people, they might be seen more quickly. Um, or maybe it doesn't even affect care. What it affects is hospital operations. Like people that are low risk for stroke, um, maybe you just start preparing their room for discharge and that makes the hospital more efficient. Maybe, you know, the radiologist is still going to look at their scan, but it's just going to save you some money, save you some time in the long run, make more patients be able to be seen. Now, what's most useful for that is a variant of conformal that's called selective classification. Okay. Here, the guarantee that we get is it's classification with abstention, right? So the model is allowed to say, I don't know. And within the fraction of like data points where the model says, I know the answer, the accuracy will be, let's say 90% or 95% or 99%. Okay. So in other words, we get two things from our model. We get a P hat, which says, how sure am I that I know the answer? And we get a Y hat. That's what's the answer. And conditionally on the probability being large, like conditionally on the model saying it's certain, the accuracy is going to be high, independent of the accuracy of your original model. Okay. So what's the caveat? The caveat is, of course, if the model is no good and there's just no way for it to give you a high accuracy, you're just never going to predict. You're just never going to use the model. But if the model can guarantee you 90% accuracy, you know, when it's more than 
80% confident, then you'll discover that using this procedure. Um, it's just another form of this risk control stuff. Um, yeah, and of course you can do this in combination with other risks. Here's an example of the abstention procedure. Here's a prediction that was kept. The Y hat was red panda, the Y was red panda, that's good. Here's a prediction that was abstained upon. This model wasn't sure, so it said, I, I don't know about this one. The ground truth is red fox. The model thought it was a kit fox. Now, you might ask, what is the difference between a red fox and a kit fox? Well, a kit fox is a baby fox, and this is a baby red fox. Think about it. Boom. The model did the right thing here. You can't choose between these two labels. So I'll just end by saying um, something about this recent work that uh, I worked on with Jordan and Andrea and Mike and Jatan are my advisors here at Berkeley um, on conformal decision theory, which is to say, you know, we've been talking about prediction sets and uncertainty this whole time or, you know, predictions and uncertainty. Um, but a lot of times you actually just don't, you can't use sets. You don't care about them. Like sets are just like totally irrelevant to my downstream task. Why would I ever even form them? What people, people like very rarely want sets. That's why the selective classification stuff is good. Selective classification stuff is good because no one actually like ever has to look at a set. It's just like when the model predicts, it's a high accuracy. People like that. But what people like more is just help me make a good decision. Just do the downstream thing. No sets at all. Um, so an example would be like, help me plan through all these pedestrians in a safe way period. Don't construct sets, just do the planning. Um, and there's a way to, act, to repurpose basically the mathematics of conformal prediction to do this. So yeah, here's my proof by meme that this is important. You know, you can't, as a doctor, it's not very useful if you say, I'm so sorry, sir, the test is returned. It says you're either sick or you're not sick. You know, come on. Not useful. What you want to do is be able to say, hey, you know, what? how aggressive should our treatment be of whatever we think that you have? But that's what's actually actionable information. So here's an example of this. Um, it's just a toy example. Um, let's say we're running a factory. Uh, the factory is producing parts. Um, the faster I run the factory, the more parts I get out. But also, the more defects are produced by the factory. It's like in, running the speed of the factory faster means that there's more errors. And then running the factory slower that means that um, there's fewer errors, but fewer parts. What I want you to do is find basically the fastest speed that you can run the factory, such that the error rate of the factory is gonna be less than or equal to alpha. So notice prediction sets, totally useless here. You can't abstain. What does it mean to have a set that contains error, no error? Useless. Just run the factory at the right speed. Um, and you can do this using conformal. The lambda is this, just directly the speed of the factory. Um, and by the way, this uses a conformal that is a, a version of conformal that works for non-IID sequences. You, it works for arbitrary sequences. So you don't need to know anything about the factory other than if you run it slow enough, it will eventually have a good error rate. Like there needs to be some, basically there needs to be some safe possible, like some safe policy that you can take. But maybe by being more aggressive, you might be able to produce more parts. The algorithm will do that for you automatically. Regardless of like, and there's no distributions here. It's totally um, adversarial in terms of the setup, okay? So in other words, proof by picture of what we're doing is we're saying, hey, you know, we're gonna look at this defect rate and online sequentially, we're gonna tune Lambda such that, you know, it oscillates in such a way that the, the error rate of our factory at time t is no is basically no more than alpha plus one over t. Okay, so it may never converge, but it's just gonna do this schedule in such a way that um, you're guaranteed not to make too many bad parts. Okay, so I won't go through all the theory of how this works, but the basic idea is um, you run an algorithm that, uh, yeah, let's maybe draw a new page here. You run an algorithm that says, hey, this is lambda speed. Let's say at time one through T. Let's say at time one, I started off my lambda lambda naught. I make an error. What I'm going to do is at time step two, I'm going to decrease lambda. So 
So this is error. If I make another error, I'm going to decrease lambda error. If I make a good part, I'm going to increase lambda, but a little less than I decreased it before. So this is good. And what happens is that this schedule for picking lambda is going to guarantee you the error rate from above. Okay. And it's going to guarantee you, regardless of the distribution of your data, distribution of your data may be changing. Your robot may be changing. Everything may be changing. As long as there's some, you know, as long as if you take basically lambda very low, that you're producing enough good parts. Even if the whole process is like not stationary? No stationarity, no probabilistic assumption at all. Arbitrary sequence of real numbers. No assumption on the factory either, other than this, eventually there must be some slow. Behavior. But that's still like an asymptotic guarantee. Like, like no, it's actually a finite sample. The guarantee is here. Um, yeah, we have a big O, but it's not okay. Yeah, it's like something like it's k eta minus k eta plus one or something, where eta is like the step size that I take in lambda space. Um, and the guarantee says that I'm my empirical risk at time t is no worse than alpha plus basically one over T, where this is a constant that's usually reasonable. And K is like the number of time steps that I need to like run my slow speed in order to achieve a good error rate down there. But you basically never hit this when you have a good factor. So- Could um, you, uh, go sorry, ahead. question again from the virtual audience. Could you give some, um, <clears throat> I mean, I think I get the high level intuition, but like with the with the previous formulation of conformal where we're talking about distributions, it seems very clear to me. Like I have IID data, I'm looking at something based on my calibration data, I'm gonna get some uh, good guarantees that it's gonna look similar in future data, like the risk. Um, yeah. Could you speak more to the, the intuition for the guarantees here? Obviously it's based on, you know, more online learning type of, you know, results with adversarial sequences. So it's not not the same intuition at all. And I'm struggling to see a little bit. It's not all the same intuition. intuition. It's not is. like, yeah, it's very yeah. much, you know, it's not online learning exactly. Uh, like the results don't follow from online learning results, but it's definitely in that same right. sphere. Um, yeah. And the intuition basically is that like, let's say this is the space of Lambda and I have like an adversarially bad factory. Yeah. Let's, Assume just for simplicity, this isn't exactly what we assume. Um, but let's assume for the sake of this like discussion about intuition that there's some lambda naught such that when I go go below lambda naught, yeah, like I can never make an error. Like I can run my right. factor slow enough that there's no, you know, just for just for the sake of intuition. Yeah. The point is that no, like I'll take my steps in such a way that I Actually, I go below, like if I'm making a lot, a lot of errors, I'm going to dip below Lambda. And then if you ask me to make no more than, you know, 10% errors, I'll stay here 90% of the time. And then Got I'll bump it. Up. And then here I might make an error. Here my adversary may screw me up. But I'm always going to go below. Back you dip Got back. It. So all of this style of work there is there's a literature about the stuff regarding prediction sets and conformal. This is more about decisions, but they're the same idea. The same the idea is that there exists a safe policy that I can run. Got it. Um, and in prediction sets, it's very clear what the safe policy is. It's just give me an infinite set. Yeah. Um, but here, you know, you need to assume the existence of it somehow. Um, but Got once it. you do that, then basically the same sorts of math will apply. Got it. That's super helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, and, and by the way, this when, when things are good, you never go below here, right? You just sort of like stay up here. But this is how you get the guarantee for adversarial stuff. Yeah, okay. So I'll show you some videos. I don't know if I pulled them up, so I might have to go to the project website. Um, here, I'll show you some videos of robot navigation. And here, the idea is that like um, the thing that the Lambda that we're tuning is the reward that's given to the robot for staying away from humans. So if Lambda is very big, it's just going to start running away from people. Um, but you want to tune that online in such a way that you navigate safely. 
Okay, so there's again, no sets. It's just online reward tuning. And here's what happens when you do that. So this is the robot. Yeah, so you'll see what happens is that when it gets kind of close to people, it starts going like, whoa, I'm gonna run away. Well, I'm gonna run away. And it does that in such a way that the policy is, is assured that it's gonna be no more than two meters on average away from a person, right? And there's also other kinds of guarantees that you can prove for such a procedure, but that's the relevant one. Now, what happens when you do this with prediction sets? When you do it with prediction sets, in order to plan a safe trajectory with pre prediction sets, i.e. just like accounting for the uncertainty of the model separately from the uncertainty of the, from the decision-making process, it's super duper conservative. It stops. And the reason it stops is because you need to basically do multiplicity correction over every single person in this image. And it ends up being like, it, you end up getting very strange results from doing procedures like this. Um, it's, in other words, much more optimal to uh, take into account the decision when you're doing this like risk analysis than to just like say, hey, I'll go to my predictions and then let's propagate that. That's not what you should do. You should just calibrate everything directly. Um, and of course, you can be very conservative and just, you know, run away from people. But then that leads to very strange behavior. So yeah, I mean, at the beginning of this video, what you'll see is the robot does something pretty okay. It says, oh, no, I'm confused. And then it sees a path and it starts going for it. Nice, nice, nice. And then it sees some people in the distance and says, oh, no. And then it runs away. You don't want that either. Um, okay, so that's the idea. Um, and I'll say one last thing, which is that you can also do this in batch. One uh, way of doing this in batch, um, and this is really not my work, it's some work by some collaborators at MIT and I was just helping out with a few things, um, but Cassandra, Christina and Sishin, who are really the people to thank for this is, you can do like adaptive sampling. Like let's say I'm imaging a, a sample like I'm in microscopy. And I don't want to kill the sample by irradiating, irradiating it too much. Or, you know, I'm doing an MRI. I don't want to like sample forever because people don't like sitting in MRIs for three hours. So what I'm going to do is figure out some sort of an adaptive sampling scheme that says, hey, if I were to reconstruct this with a neural net after sampling for 30 minutes, um, how, uh, you know, how good would my final output be? Um, and you can sort of calibrate that sampling time uh, in such a way that you get a guarantee on the final reconstruction. That's another form of decision that you can make. In other words, how long am I sampling? Which pixels am I sampling? Okay, so that's the talk. Um, looking forward to discussing more. Any questions? First to the in-person audience, and then we can switch over to the remote ones. Alex. So there's a lot of work in conformal on trying to adapt to distribution shift in various ways. The So the, the talk was kind of divided into two parts, as someone on Zoom pointed out. Um, the first bit that was like batch, you give me a calibration data set. None of the algorithms that I presented there are robust to distribution shift. Uh, but there's there, there's variants of making them so. So for, for example, if you know importance weights or likelihood ratios, um, you can reweight your distribution before doing this like calibration of the quantile in such a way that you know you have coverage on the new distribution. Um, there's results kind of of that flavor that work in the batch setting. Um, now in the online setting, it's obviously totally robust to any distribution shift. Um, the, at least the theory is. And then if you have a good model, then in practice, it will be too. This is more about like this, like this robot stuff and the decision theory stuff. That's more about like um, con controlling uh, something online um, with no assumption of, you know, past things being relevant to future things. Um, yeah, so does that answer the question? I can put you to some papers on distribution shift if you're interested. Other questions? Yeah. So 
how does conformal apply in the object detection problem where you have a probability of an object, the probability, the size of the bounding box, and the probability of the image class? So, yeah, I'll go back to the slide. Um, so the idea here is that like you have basically like a three-stage pipeline where one is like identify object ID. So that's like control recall. And then the, the Lambda, you have one Lambda for that, which is like your objectness metric. So usually detectors will have something that says, hey, you know, how, how likely is this pixel to come from an object or something? And they have various like complicated schemes for figuring out where the objects are in the image before they segment them, before they classify them. Um, and so this will threshold. See, this thing tries to autocorrect my handwriting. Check this out. Boom. Look what it does. Unbelievable. AI has gone too far. Um, yeah, so you, you'll put a threshold on that that says how much, how object-like do I need to be in order to be classified an object? And you'll calibrate the recall using this one. And then you'll, in parallel, sort of like class and seg. And these are the, the sort of like normal lambdas that we had before, like this threshold on the segmentation model or the quantile that you use for forming prediction sets. Um, now you have this three-dimensional space of lambdas Um, so this would be lambda one, lambda two, lambda three. Um, and you want to find like some, some like volume within the set of three dimensional lambdas where everything within their controls, all three risks. Um, and we have techniques for doing that basically. Um, so yeah, look at learning. Yeah. So hopefully that answers the question, at least roughly. Other questions? So I think conditional validity is like the the thing where you probably wouldn't get like finite sample mm -hmm. so like are there like what's the like the, the best you can do for like with conform prediction like I think there's no other way to get some like condition valid prediction intervals anyway but like are there um non-asymptotic results under like maybe extra assumptions where you can still get like some form of finite sample condition you know maybe not point wise but like yeah absolutely so um there's a lot of work on this um uh the basic so the basic idea is that when your space is discrete conditional coverage is trivial Right. If your space is discrete and the number of elements in it is small, let's say initial coverage is trivial. If I have like n data points and I have two groups, I run conformal within both groups. And there's a way of combining those such that you get conditional coverage within the groups. That's easy. Same thing with labels. Let's let's say I want to get conditional coverage on every Y, and Y has like 10 levels. Um, as long as I observe some number of samples in every discrete bin then I'm going to get conditional coverage. That's great. Um, and there's relaxations of that. People, this is an active area of research. Um, but uh, yeah, there's relaxations of that that will uh, work for not discrete bins, but, you know, bins that are smooth. Um, yeah, so that's the basic story. So like there. binning approaches are like the... Dominant. The, the dominant way to get finite sample conditional coverage. Anything else will probably be asymptotic. Well, the, bin, the the smoothness stuff is not necessarily asymptotic. But yeah, like if you assume your distribution is smooth, then you can pull nearby samples mm -hmm. and get a conditional coverage guarantee. That's also fine. Um, there's a recent paper by uh, Cherry and Gibbs and Candez on this that you might be interested in reading. There's also some work by Rena Barber on this topic. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, so, but unless you have some structure on the space, then obviously, you know, this is not possible for any method, as you're pointing out. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? I had a more abstract question. Like, what are the other ways we see a different corner? So we didn't scan it into the decision making beyond the job that we need to have. I like instead of having separate and um, yeah, good question. Um, well, I think that the batch algorithm that we have for conformal decision theory still isn't very good. Um, the batch algorithm is computationally infeasible, basically, um, except in certain restricted scenarios. Um, and I would be personally very interested in seeing if there is a version of that algorithm that can be run um or a way of running that out you know some cool statistical tricks that can make that algorithm run another thing that you can imagine doing is like well this is a one-dimensional parameter lambda that indexes the decision from most to least aggressive but what if i want to like maximize utility as well what if i don't just want to control risk but i also want to maximize utility but, well this theory doesn't exactly take that into account there's some folks in mike's group that are interested in working on this so if you want, I can, you know, point you in their direction. Um, some ideas. Other questions? Yeah, thank you. I've got another. Sorry. Oh, oh no. <laughs> I was clapping already. Oh, go ahead. I, uh, I was I was trying to defer to people in the room. Um, I guess you just you said something about the batch version of the online thing being difficult, but. Is there, uh, I'm gonna ignore that for a moment. I'm gonna ask the question I was gonna ask originally, which is, um, is there anything preventing you from taking your online, you, know, you talked about distribution shift as being a potential problem, right? For the batch variance. What's stopping you from just taking whatever theory you have for the online version and just doing that for everything else? You know, selective prediction, I just won't make predictions if I start to make a lot of errors or, you know, outputting sets if I have a set that's slightly too small, I'll just start out putting the whole label set. You know, like, is there some barrier other than in practice you get, you know, huge sets and never predicting uh, as an output? Or is there some challenge with sort of taking those guarantees and kind of back propagating them through the that's rest of the presentation? Question. No, yeah. So I would say um, uh, those algorithms can definitely be applied and the online guarantees can be extended in the batch setting. Um, yeah, it's basically doing so is fairly straightforward and you can definitely do this, like the selective classification procedure that you described. That's something that I would definitely run. Like I would run that algorithm. I agree. Um, now the, maybe I'll just draw here the difference. The reason why it's not as compelling in the batch setting is because the guarantee that you get is something like this out of the online thing. The fraction of errors over the whole sequence is less than or equal to alpha plus some small constant over T. Now, in, in the back, so notice that this is weaker than the normal conformal guarantee. And that's basically the reason why it's less interesting to people in batch. It's because in batch, the thing that you're trying to get is ym plus one is in the set with probability one minus alpha. This is a statement about ym plus one. Um, and that's why people like it more for batch. Um, I see. So it's a statement about the future as opposed to a statement about what will have happened so far. Exactly. At any given point in time. Yeah, that makes sense as a conceptual difference that I could imagine people Great. caring about. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Well, I clap again. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Thanks to everyone so for coming. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Nice to meet Thanks you everyone. all. Yeah, nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. No, no, thank you. See you all later.